told me that maybe you will lie. In fact, you didn't even the cat story is true. <laughs> so bonjour, tout le monde. Um, he didn't tell you that I will speak French, no. So, <laughs> so you had time to see my first slide and uh, the structure of my presentation. I will spend time mostly on uh, items uh, number two and four. So let's see uh, first uh, the importance of pelagic fish for food security and then the large inter annual and interdecadal variability of those species. So um, small pelagic fishes uh, contribute a lot uh, to uh, the total catches of marine fish and cephalopods. Here uh, I exclude the shellfish. And um, as you can see in the recent years, um, there was a leveling of, of, of the catches of small pelagic fish, whereas um, the leveling of uh, demersal fishes occurred much earlier. And um, as you can see, um, as a result of the sum of everything, now we are about 80 million tons of, of total catches. And um, the proportion of um, pelagic fish versus demersal fish is increasing. Um, due to a number of factors, uh, fishing down the food web, as you know, but also an increasing demand. Um, the next slide uh, is about that. Uh, you see here the human consumption uh, of above uh, 100 million tons of, of uh, fish products. This uh, includes everything. Now back in the picture are the shellfish. And the, the fisheries contribute to most of it, but uh, the aquaculture is quite a substantial part of it. But not all fisheries go to human consumptions. Part of it uh, go to uh, a large part of it, to fish meal and fish oil, which feed the aquaculture. Uh, of course, don't be fooled by these numbers. Uh, this is not uh, like in the Bible, the multiplication of fishes. Uh, it's only because in aquaculture, you have, first of all, um, uh, freshwater aquaculture and extensive aquaculture uh, in addition to intensive aquaculture that benefit not only from uh, the input of uh, fish meal and fish oil and also direct uh, uh, subsidies of uh, fisheries but also from uh, agriculture products especially um, soya meal. Uh, the rest of the catches go to discard this is an estimation of course and then to various other things. So uh, how these things will, will evolve in the future? Well, um, I forgot to tell you that um, the substantial part is still small, but uh, when you consider that uh, two-thirds of the planet is made of the ocean, 88% 8 of uh, the aquatic primary production global goes to one or the other of those two things. So it's quite interesting. So um, now you get the same figures with the, in um, orange the value um, that uh, is uh, expected, or oh, I didn't put that in the figure, uh, for year um, 2020, that within 15 years ahead. As you can see, the numbers will, will increase. Um, these are our guesses and estimates, of course. Um, and um, the, the pressure uh, will, for pelagic fishes uh, transform to fish meal for feeding aquaculture and we don't know which proportion will go to aquaculture and which will go to farming of poultry, swine and others. But um, it is a substantial increase and um, we, we, we expect, of course, a higher pressure as a result on small pelagic fishes. So now the large interannual and interdecadal variability um, is illustrated here first uh, for the anchovies because it's a short leaved species, the shortest uh, among the group. And um, notice that this, this is catches, and I will come back on this point on the next slide. But uh, still being catches uh, that globally reflect uh, to a certain extent the abundance, uh, you can see a different level of variability, interannual variability, like here and there, high bumps and also interdecadal variability for most of the resources, and this applies for many other species. So um, you can complain that, uh, of course, uh, this is um, only, uh, this was only catches, um, but now um, if we look at uh, the variability 
that um, comes from, oh sorry, I don't know why this animation doesn't work, okay, doesn't matter. Um, these are on our acoustic estimates in South Africa. Uh, so it's a good estimation of biomass. Here acoustics work, works very well for different reasons. It's a, nearly an ideal situation. And as you can see, uh, the variability of both the, the spawner biomass and the recruit is extremely high. We thought when I, I arrived around here and people told me that the, the range of variation was a factor of five of recruitment. And uh, a few years later, we have this extraordinary couple of years and then uh, the, the factor of variation variability was 20. So it's not only catch as, as you can see, it's really the biomass that is changing. Also, a uh, characteristic of um, um, pelagic fisheries is that the market is global. Uh, here you have the production with the main countries and the consumptions and as you can see only with few exceptions like Japan, uh, the production goes elsewhere. Peru, for instance, it goes mainly to China and, and so on. And so you have uh, here uh, the large boxes are for fish meal and the small one uh, for um, uh, fish oil. Uh, so uh, this is a global market and um, it has, of course, some consequences uh, in terms of uh, sustainability. So now let's see why those fishes are, are so special and I, I will decline this uh, in, in a few um, slides afterwards. So first the life uh, uh, trade history and um, this the first one of course is that these species are short lived uh, typically uh, four years for anchovy, eight years for sardine and um, as a result the abundance at the given time relies on, on a few year classes and with exploitation of course there are even less uh, year classes uh, uh, in, in nature so there is little buffer effect uh, the fecundity is uh, really high uh, in the order of several hundred of eggs per gram of female per year. So these females are really spawning machines, you see. And uh, they, uh, this allows them um, to test a variety of uh, favorable envir environmental situations, what uh, Andy Bakun calls the loopholes, um, and make their way, despite all this variability, um, to, to reproduce. Uh, it's not necessarily, um, that doesn't mean necessarily that uh, each female uh, in average uh, will succeed in uh, producing um, a, a larvae or every one or two years. Um, it is more likely, although we, we lack information, uh, that it's a few females every year um, that succeed. Um, but 95% or 99% of the others don't have a single egg successful in terms of uh, reproduction. So there is a high but uh, very variable uh, natural mortality, uh, especially in the early stages. And um, these species, most of them are pelagic uh, spawners, uh, with the exception of herrings, but uh, still in that case the larvae are pelagic. So there is no direct parental care, but at the opposite cannibalism very often. The high dispersion and high mortality at early stage. Uh, there is a paradigm um, in fishery science, and uh, I will try to dismystify a number of paradigms during this talk, uh, telling that because uh, mortality is very high in the early stages, this is where uh, the environmental plays a major role and uh, structure the interannual and interdecadal variability. It's, it's possible, it's not of use. Recent work show that uh, it's also important, the interannual variability uh, at further stage, meaning that this uh, exponential decrease uh, of the natural mortality um, doesn't necessarily uh, move like this, but maybe translate like that, or maybe sometimes it's even uh, more important in the uh, later stages. Um, another paradigm uh, is that um, because um, there is no parental care and because also um, those uh, uh, fish are short-lived and um, they, um, in fact, uh, there is no um, grow, growth over fishing in small pelagic fishes. But in fact, um, it is due to this uh, feeling um, not only necessary to protect the juveniles, as most uh, management uh, issues try to do, but 
it's also interesting uh, to protect the adults because despite the absence of parental care, um, there is in indirect parental care in the sense that, as you know, recent works show that uh, the older females are most su successful because they uh, spawn more, of course, but also because they spawn with, in a more protected period of time. Uh, they migrate further. Their eggs are, are uh, bigger and with more uh, fat uh, reserve and so on. So um, it could be um, interesting to change our way of seeing uh, the way we manage fisheries and try to, to protect also the, the, the adults, fish and the older mostly. So the position uh, in the ecosystem, they are dominant in biomass. There are few fishes in, in the ecosystems. So this is uh, once more the Banguela, where you can see the place of small pelagic fishes. But in, term, in terms of biomass, but in terms of number of species, it's very reduced. That's why the, the, the concept, the wording of uh, uh, wasp waste um, uh, was, was used. So 50% of the total pelagic landings are represented only by seven uh, species. Uh, maybe I should move there so you can see better. Uh, and many species uh, can switch from particular to uh, filtering feeding. And they occupy a mid-trophic position, of course, in the, in the food web, and they have a, a key role on trophic controls in many cases. Uh, what is also very uh, particular is their special behavior. They are gregarious uh, species. Uh, Julia Parrish could tell you even more than me on that. Um, they aggregate at different levels, uh, subpopulation, uh, then uh, clusters, where you have different schools, the, the black dots are of schools or shows. And um, even within a school, you have a nucleus. So they like to be together. And to, this is table shows you, I wouldn't go into details, the uh, order of magnitude of the number, the weight, and, and, and the size. So it's uh, nearly a fractal distribution. So the, this is good uh, to escape predators, this strategy of uh, being uh, gregarious. But of course, it's the worst scenario to escape fishing gear, and fishing fishermen take uh, advantage of this behavior. So there are a specific relationship in mixed school. Uh, we, uh, with some colleagues that developed the meeting point hypothesis, a school trap hypothesis was developed by um, Andy Bakun and Curie. Um, I wouldn't go into details on that. There are special constraints uh, linked to coastal productivity, uh, which is often observed, especially in appalling areas. There are changes in the extension of the distributional area, and also uh, catchability is a function of abundance. This is very well known and has been described and modeled um, by Fox, amongst others. And uh, there is also a medium range of seasonal migration, uh, which is, as I said earlier, related to body lengths. The bigger the fish, the further they mi can migrate. And um, observed also those change uh, in response to physical forcing. OK, these are the Fox, McCall, and so on, well-known references about the, the relationship uh, between the biomass and the distribution. Density dependence. Uh, you, you all know these figures, you see, uh, from textbooks uh, of stock recruitment relationship. Uh, but to me, uh, this is still a, a theory, which is not fully supported by solid facts, and I will illustrate that. And uh, it's, people say it's possibly dampened by environmental effects. But um, you will see, in fact, um, um, some people telling you that those uh, relationships Exists. This is an example for the Pacific and uh, Atlantic uh, uh, stocks of, of herring. And um, the author is quite happy with that. Uh, myself, I was happy not with all figures, but some of them uh, looks very familiar uh, to me. And uh, I thought, wow, well, this is not so bad. But when you look more into details, if you zoom, for instance, uh, on, on this one, uh, what you see is that uh, the zero axis, uh, this is confusing, you see, the zero is here. Uh, and it's the same for most of the other, well, all the other figures. Uh, so um, uh, to me, this is just uh, a small numbers. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm more or less happy with this one, where the zero is more, more or less around here. 
So this is not of use, and um, especially for pelagic fish. And um, some colleagues uh, in South Africa uh, did some estimates, uh, you see, of uh, the confidence limits, because people claim that this is the climate, this is confidence limit, this is. But as you can see, um, even this was uh, the special year of 2000, you remember, in the previous slide, with very high biomass. Um, you, you can see anything there. And um, I did, didn't put for the student uh, this paper on my list that I should have maybe uh, from uh, Shepard and Cushing, although it was written 18 years ago. It's still very refreshing to, to, to read that and to see that for them, you see, it's possibly this relationship is still a stochastic one. Nonetheless, uh, there are uh, some density dependence uh, um, relationship that we observe, but they are not that much uh, on uh, the stock recruitment relationship directly. Uh, we observe that in South Africa, and we try, of course, uh, to, to um, see if uh, those responses, you see, you see the biomass here, fluctuation with uh, two high periods and one low period, and how uh, the uh, condition factor, oh, this is in French, that's good for you. <laughs> this is the condition factor in two seasons. And uh, this is the gonadosomatic index. Uh, as, as you can see, it seems to respond. And there are other similar examples. Let's move now to the second part, with the pelagic fish and the uh, physical environment. And I will go through different uh, times scale. Um, Short-term effects are mainly on catchability. I start by that because most of the time people just think when they talk about climate uh, effects, climate change and so on, on abundance. But response to, on catchability of catchability is also quite important. This is an example of the Peruvian fishery where we had this extraordinary El Nino. This is the temperature where you get a, a 10 degrees anomaly nearly, uh, 8 degrees sorry, uh, anomaly. And as a, as a result, and with a certain lag, uh, the um, short lag, uh, the size of the school uh, changes, decreases during this period. I will go very quickly on this slide and on a few others, uh, because this is available from textbooks. It's just to, to remember you all the, the effort of, of the scientific community during the last uh, decades to understand the medium-term effect on stock abundance, all the theories that are summed up more or less in the Bakun Strad hypothesis, the one we work out in South Africa. But despite this effort, including from our team, today uh, it's very difficult, nearly impossible, to predict the recruitment of fish, even the pre-recruitment, uh, with some degrees of confidence. Uh, we, we, we tried doing that uh, using uh, this kind of um, model. In fact, we coupled uh, a physical oceanographical model, which is a ROMS model, with um, particle tracking Lagrangian uh, IBM, um, where the, the particles represent eggs and then larvae, and then they experience mortality, uh, natural mortality, and um, um, also they um, die ac according to, to temperature and so on. Um, we gain a lot of knowledge using that, particularly on the strategy, the reproductive strategy to play the, the f most favorable place to spawn, to reproduce the time or so, but not yet in terms of prediction. The long effects, um, so there is, as I said earlier, large uh, interval decadal variability. Um, it is often claimed to be environmentally driven. Although there are alternative hypotheses, uh, like uh, interspecific dynamics or disease uh, and, and so on, there is no clear long-term periodicity, but rather what is called, uh, we call that pseudo-periodicity. Some other people call it quasi-periodicity. Uh, With um, a period, a pseudo-period, which varies around 40, 60 years. This is uh, visible in, in some uh, scale deposition. This is a very famous... Uh, a series of uh, Tim Bob Gardner for study in the California. Um, some people like Kleisterin propose uh, global climatic indices um, and um, which have also this same property uh, of a uh, total cycle of the same length of uh, 60 years. Here, here are some of them. In black you have uh, different fisheries, catches once more as a proxy for abundance and uh, here is the same uh, climatic index. 
So people claim, okay, it works, but the problem here is that you have very few degrees of freedom because you have only one or two realization of, of cycle um, because everything is largely autocorrelated. And uh, as you can see, there is a lag, uh, sometimes important, sometimes shorter, between uh, the climate and the, and the response of the fisheries. Uh, you can be happy when uh, um, fisheries are, are stocks are lagging behind, but in some cases they are lagging before, uh, like here, so it's a bit more difficult to explain. Uh, although I like very much part of this work, I'm not fully convinced um, by such an empirical approach, because here what people did is um, just to look at a number of environmental indices and uh, smooth them, work them out, and then empirically try to find some correlation with uh, the abundance of uh, seabirds or, or fish. Um, but there is n no real process uh, explained behind that. I'm much more convinced by a few works, unfortunately I don't know some of them uh, convincing in, in pelagic fish, but in salmon, you are familiar here with salmon, this is uh, in Europe, this is Bogron and Raid uh, um, work, where although with very little degrees of freedom, but at least you can see that the anomalies uh, of, of the environment are cascading through the food web, you see phytoplankton, then Kalenis uh, forma feed marsh because it's copy pot feeding on the phytoplankton and salmon, young salmon feeding mostly on Kalenis. So this is much more convincing to me. Then there is this big issue of uh, species alternation and global synchrony. synchrony. So people uh, wonder, me in particular, if uh, this is uh, due to uh, environmental trigger or, or the internal dynamic of the species. Um, in fact, when you look at that series, what, what can you see? You see the, the, the Japanese series, for instance, uh, this one, you see, uh, with two bumps, um, looks um, very uh, correlated uh, with the, the Californian uh, sardine series. Uh, and uh, you have um, sardines uh, that are out of phase, uh, sardine here, those two, with uh, anchovy in most cases. So people think that, okay, uh, this means uh, that uh, there is a global synchrony of the species. This means in that the, in a given area there is this alternation between uh, species, and they all develop a lot, many theories on that. Um, possibly they are right. It's very difficult to, to, to see, although when you look uh, at uh, paleontological records, the one, for instance, of uh, Baumgartner, I will show it later on again, uh, you see that uh, it's not always the case that uh, sardine and anchovy are out of phase. Sometimes they were in phase, sometimes out of phase in the past. Um, so, uh, and uh, the, the other thing is that if you uh, think that for any reasons uh, those species are variating in their abundance in a pseudo-cyclic manner, pseudo-periodic, um, then, and if they have more or less the same pseudo-period, it is expected uh, from a very simple mathematical point of view, that there will be some time in phase, some time out of phase, and some time lagged. But uh, because with recent uh, uh, studies, we just have one or two realizations, we tend to generalize and think that, okay, it works like that. But it could be just by chance that even if uh, sometimes very convincing, the, um, the synchrony, uh, that it occurs. Let me give you an example. Um, if you, you use, for instance, uh, something that is uh, um, very um, aperiodic or very pseudo-periodic, like the, the, the uh, weather, you see, uh, at the scale of, of, of a week uh, or of a few days, like I suppose here in Seattle, you have uh, two, three days, four days of bad weather, and then two, three days, depending on the season, of good weather, and, and, and so on, more or less. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. And uh, some people very pessimistic will tell you, uh, young people especially are not so much experienced with weather, very young people, oh, it's always poor weather on the weekend. And uh, some other very optimistic will tell you, oh, it's always good weather during the rest of the week, you see. But in fact, no, sometimes it's true, sometimes it is the opposite. It's, it's more or less the case, I think, with uh, those uh, things. Um, also important is the relationship between the distribution area and abundance. Uh, linked to the catchability problem that I mentioned earlier, you know all these figures of two different um, 
um, levels of, of abundance for, 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 for the, the thardine in different areas. Uh, people try to explain that by different theories. There is a McCall theory, Basin theory, that say that when the abundance decreases, then uh, the fish are, are confined in the most uh, higher favorable habitat here, whereas the uh, pitcher and uh, uh, say that, um, in fact, the basin is flat, any place is as favorable as another, but it's just because the fish are gregarious that you find them in a place. And with my colleague, we developed, uh, inspired by Monk, uh, this uh, theory of the refuge area where, in fact, the fish are in several places. Uh, in Peru, for instance, Monk noticed that it's the places uh, just facing the, the fish mill factories. Not by chance, probably. Effects of climate change. Um, I will go quickly on that. We uh, are busy now finalizing a book on, on that with the global people. And um, the lesson here is that um, it, it's quite complex. You, can, you have to read this uh, figure from the bottom to the top. Um, and the effect of those changes, uh, you see, are... Um, complex and with a lot of, of feedbacks like here and not fully understood. Nonetheless, uh, because we, we cannot escape making some prediction, although it's our more, it's our more scenario than uh, prediction, um, there are a number of things that are supposed to happen in the next decades due to those changes. Um, so globally, um, the productivity of pelagic fishes shouldn't change a lot, but uh, locally, there will be a lot of, of changes that are expected. Um, this is a continuation of, of this slide. And um, I discussed this morning uh, with uh, Dr. Bailey and told him uh, that uh, this particular ballet, you see, that uh, the population located uh, at the, along the latitudinal boundary of a species range are more likely to be affected by uh, these changes because they, they, they permanently are, have to struggle. So now they would be favored or, or disadvantages by, by these changes. This was his finding with uh, Dr. Wooster long ago, and afterwards, uh, Ranson Mayer um, did some work on that. Let's move to the um, uh, third section, quite short. Pelagic fish within the food web, food web controls, etc. So um, there, there, is, there are these three major theories on the, work, the way it works in terms of control and profit flow. The bottom-up where uh, any change negative in this case of in the uh, environment uh, will affect uh, the primary production and then everything will be negatively affected along the trophic web. Whereas in the top-down control it's exactly the opposite. Uh, decrease in the predator will favor the prey and so on, cascading. And uh, re more recently, uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Philip Curie and Andy Bakun, um, proposes Wathwaite hypothesis where the pelagic fish being the Wathwaite place of the ecosystem are controlling their prey and also their predator. So it's a mixture of those two things. So underlying once more the importance of those pelagic fish. So we are, I feel, in the first steps in modeling the trophic webs. For a long time, of course, there was uh, this famous uh, ecopass models with uh, Ecopass with Ecosim, so the derivative of it. But it, was, it is still difficult to reproduce realistic spatiotemporal dynamics using these models, you see. Um, nonetheless, it was helpful for quantifying the interaction, for calibrating our view biased by the fisheries of uh, the nature, and um, also derivating some uh, indices uh, of the status of the fisheries or the ecosystems. Uh, with all those um, functional impact factor, uh, FIB, uh, and so on. But uh, more recently, there are new, cl new classes of models, um, alternative models that thought to, to, to show up with a better coupling uh, with the, the physics and uh, the biochemistry, uh, like Nemurofish, Osmos, just to cite two of them. Osmos has been developed by our group, uh, by Yun Shin and uh, colleagues. And um, in fact, it's based on the size. You see, predation is structured by size. Big fish eating a smaller fish. And um, of course, with um, consequences uh, on terms of the size classes and the species classes. And um, um, recently, 
um, a student uh, of uh, Yun Shin um, coupled this osmosis model that takes into account foraging, production, reproduction, etc., etc., with a NPZD ROMS model that modulate with a double compartment of N of V uh, that um, the the lower trophic levels, and um, it's a double way coupling with a uh, here the forcing of plankton um, as a prey for for fish stock provided by this model, and the feedback resulting for predation mortality on, on uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton by uh, forage fish mainly. So let's move now because uh, I have been told that people here are mostly interested by uh, uh, sustainable ma management, this is the main focus of this school. So um, I will go through these uh, different issues now. So stock structure and resilience uh, to exploitation. Um, this is due to my colleague uh, Philippe Curie and co-authors. And where, although we are very ignorant of the structure of pelagic fish population and possibly of many others, there are more and more evidence uh, that um, the population are structured. Even when fish live together in the same school doesn't mean that they belong to the same subpopulation. They can be genetically distinct because at the time of reproduction they split. And so there is a biodiversity, a species biodiversity, and when you fish, you don't necessarily uh, fish equally, uh, exploit equally all those subpopulations, and you can collapse some of them, but not too many, so you, you feel that you are still uh, doing a good job being on the left hand side of the curve. But the problem is that you don't have necessarily a reversibility if you decrease your effort because you have lost this population that were adapted to particular environment situation and so on. Now I'll tell you uh, the story um, of my stays in Peru uh, that I used to visit from time to time. I work with Imarpe in this beautiful building by the sea and there is a restaurant here and from the restaurant, you can see part of the fleet. This is a huge fleet of thousands of vessels. And uh, I was um, wondering why nearly, well, every time, in fact, I went there, I saw the fleet there. And I spent sometimes uh, a few weeks, sometimes a few months, and they didn't move. But these fisheries produce uh, between 6 and 12 million tons a year. So how can it be? You see, so uh, when I asked, people told me, oh, the, the fishing is, is closed, it's not the fishing season. So you can see here the, the catch, um, you see, in, in, uh, in million tons. Um, and uh, um, this is a zoom on the recent period, you see. And as you can see, uh, the fleet capacity has grown with two different kinds of fleets. Uh, while the duration of the fishing season decreased from 170 days in 86 to, this is not updated, this is 2005, it was uh, nearly 100, and uh, then the next year it decreased to uh, 60, and last year it was 40 days. 40 days to capture 6 million tons. And when you look uh, more in details on the stock dynamics versus the, the fleet, the, the, the stock is here with uh, VPAs and capture more or less following the same trend. And uh, the total capacity of the fleet, this is measured only by the GTR, GRT. Uh, but of course, the uh, technological improvement make that, uh, in fact, is going much upper than that. And what is uh, swinging this figure is that when the fleet increase uh, the biomass increase or, or the availability of the fish increases, then the fleet react immediately, you see. But when it decreases, there is a lag, important lag, it doesn't follow. So we try to see what are uh, the implications and of this effect and also this interdecadal variability that I mentioned. So we did a, a, a model. Uh, I will not go too much into details. With four steps, I will just show you the first and the last steps. So this bioeconomical model uh, is based on a conventional model. We, then we make the uh, carrying capacity varying uh, then um, uh, on a periodic basis. Then we incorporate asymmetric investment, disinvestment, and then we combine both. So the model is very conventional. 
You see, you have a production terms, the initial model, and, and the yield terms, and the, then for the economical part, uh, the effort depends on the benefits, the difference between the sales and the cost is really basic. We, have a, we use in all our research to go step by step, start by the most basic model and, and increase a complexity when necessary rather than the opposite. Anyway, so we have an equilibrium point and attractor, this is not a surprise. But now the last step, we at the same time, we, we change the, the scheme of uh, investment, disinvestment. Instead of, of a linear function, um, well, it's still linear, but um, you have the investment which is proportional of, of the, of, to the income um, when its income are positive, but when they are negative, you see, uh, the, the, the slope of this uh, part of the curve is decreasing. So we test that and we test also a carrying capacity perfectly cyclic here because it is a model. It's not intended to reproduce the reality, just to understand. So here you will see uh, how, with the animation that we follow, how the carrying capacity will vary uh, cyclically. You will see how the investment, uh, disinvestment behavior will change from something completely near to, to, to here more increase. The response of the stock, the response of the fishing capacity, the yield and the income. So be prepared, it will be short. Uh, my mouse is here. Okay. So as you can see, of course, there is a cyclic response uh, of nearly everything is expected, but also an increase in stability. And things become really, I repeat it, completely uh, unstable, unstable and crash um, when. Um, when you have a level of investment disinvestment increasing and the amplitude of the cycle also increasing. All right. This, these are two slides that, were, uh, that I will go through very, very quickly. This, you can find this in textbooks. Um, it's just to show the different methods of management options that has been used for pelagic fish and any other species, in fact, and see the pro and cons of any of those. And as you can notice, um, Nothing is perfect. Each one has its, its merits. But um, of course, uh, the, the last one here, the two last ones, they t tend to combine those things by trying to use the adaptive management, which, which allows flexibility, which is needed when you are not able to predict, uh, like it is the case in, in, in fisheries. And um, uh, also so, um, the ecosystem approach with taking into account um, most of the environment of the, of the fish. So these are the management option and uh, same slide but for the different regulatory mechanisms that you can use. Um, most of the fisheries are, are uh, driven, are regulated by, by quotas but you can have also the control of the fleet, the control of standardized effort which is a bit better. Time closure area although it's not fully adapted but for pelagic fish but it still has some merits. Um, well, time areas is more or less adapted, but um, uh, MPA is probably less. And fish size control, as I said earlier, um, usually used to prevent the catch of small fish, which is not necessarily very useful for small um, pelagic fish, but that maybe uh, in the future, if we are able, it's not easy uh, to have a selection, a gear selecting only the older fish, but you can maybe achieve that with uh, those kind of things and trying to protect the older fish with are the, which are the most successful. Then uh, bioeconomical models, um, we developed with my colleague uh, Christian Mullen um, a model, the same approach, we start with the most simple possible model where we have at the top the, the climate change, we have some function of the, on the carrying capacity um, and you have some conventional population dynamics in the model then you have exploitation by different fleets. This is, of course, for the pelagic fish worldwide. And you have the market, the, ship, uh, the shipment first to, to different areas, as I saw in the previous slide. That, uh, this goes through markets around the world, global market, and then a demand function. So um, with this model, um, what we want to achieve, in fact, is um, implement uh, role-playing game sessions where you will have different actors around the table with a computer and uh, some of them 
will play the role uh, while the environment, the, the, the organizer, the, the coordinator will maybe change the climate. And um, you will have people representing the, the, the profession, the fishermen, other representing uh, scientists, other uh, conservationists, um, and so on, uh, managers, etc. And of course, people dealing with the markets. And they can work together, and they can compete, or they can make alliances. And um, this could be a way also ahead to to manage the fisheries. So. Based on what I told you earlier, um, we propose a two-level management strategy in which the first level deals with the short term. This is a very conventional level where people use uh, adaptive management, uh, for instance, um, management procedure based, based on, on TAC, on quotas, and then you use new system-based uh, indicators as far as possible and you try to be flexible to follow your stock by surveys several times a year, acoustic survey, real survey, whatever, or, or egg surveys. And this is business as usual in many fisheries, not everywhere. But the interesting point here is that we suggest to couple that with a long-term fleet capacity control. I don't know if it will sound uh, popular here. Where we have a country with a lot of liberalists. But um, we know that in fisheries, liberalism is not um, always efficient to protect the, the, the fisheries. So we think that um, we could take, take advantage of this pseudo-periodicity that we cannot predict uh, really, but we can exploit the properties of uh, the autocorrelation of the series using, for instance, a Bayesian approach and to try to see uh, what is uh, the best trend in terms of the, the capacity of the fleet uh, in order to reduce it when necessary and as fast as necessary and then to increase it when necessary. This will um, in fact um, avoid too much pressure. You, you can advocate that this is unnecessary. If you do that correctly, why bothering? But you have seen this problem of overcapacity, especially in Peru. And um, you have uh, in many occasion a conflict of interest with politicians in some of these countries. We work mainly with developing countries, but even in developed countries. Uh, at the end, the politicians are, are taking the decision, and uh, they, have, they have a short-term agenda. They have to deal with social and economical problems, so if you have a too high um, overcapacity uh, that you do not necessarily control with TAC and with um, um, ITQs, uh, then you face a problem. So. The solution maybe is to have a more versatile uh, national fleets or use distant foreign uh, vessel. At noon we find a name for that. Uh, maybe um, we said a mercenary fleet. I don't know if people will be happy with this terminology, but anyway, this will, will allow uh, more flexibility. Why is it so? Because in fact you can do so because the level of uncertainty that you face, of course, it's like um, uh, in the market uh, when. Uh, stock option, you see, you know afterwards where, where you are, where you were in terms of uh, being uh, on the ascending limb or the descending limb, but when you are there you, you really don't know, when you are there it's a big uncertainty, will you go up again or will you go down but once uh, you start going down, the uncertainty decreases, you see, and again, it will increase when you are fully down, you don't know if you will recover uh, tomorrow or, or within 10 years um, and so on. So you can take advantage of this uh, variation, as I said earlier. And um, also an interesting question is that uh, when you look at that uh, figures of uh, pseudoperiodicity, you have very often two kinds of pseudoperiodicity, something like this, quite regular, uh, and, and, and something with, which is quasi, I would say, uh, cyclic, you see, it's nearly a sinusoid, it's quasi sinusoidal or even pseudo-sonoisoidal, while here it's more a U-shape, you see. And um, whereas the difference between the two is due to the internal dynamics of the ecosystem or the species, or is due, due to over-exploitation, maintaining the, the stock at a lower level here is still unknown. But the idea here is, um, um, you see, uh, the optimal situation would be there. Of course, it's very idealized. But um, 
based on the same as in the option market, you see, you keep here, you sell there, and so on. You see, you're familiar with that. Whereas uh, the present situation is that, as I said, a slower decrease when the stock decreases and, and then a faster increase. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we have seen that small pelagic species share many common uh, specific traits in their life history, etc. That the majority of exploited stocks are sweetened by the exploitation, which is often oft out of phase with the environment, total impact, but short and especially in the long term. The demand will keep growing, as we have seen in the first slides, but those stocks are quite resilient. That's the good news, at least. Um, this is from one of the paper uh, from, uh, that I gave you uh, from Beverton for the students once more. The environmental changes can affect the fisheries at different levels, not only on the abundance, but also the distribution and the catchability, that we often forget. So despite those decades of research, as I told you, there is a lack of understanding of the process that prevent us to make uh, some prediction from forecast of abundance. So we need more process-oriented studies um, like IBM, but also experiments, you see, um, and uh, also uh, some um, retrospective data analysis. The stru structure must be better understood by um, molecular genetics in particular to uh, better understand the bio internal biodiversity of the species. Assessment and management of small pelagic fish stock is difficult due to these properties that I mentioned as a trait, but also a rapid response to climate change and environmental signals. So as a result, they are less tractable than many other species uh, through the conventional population dynamics uh, approach and uh, the model and the assumptions. That's why we, we propose um, to improve uh, the accuracy of our model uh, through uh, um, this uh, uh, flexible and direct and, and um, adaptive management, which is based on direct estimations that needs, uh, and I know that uh, some people, especially our colleagues from NOAA are working on that, that need to be based on um, direct techniques, direct estimation through acoustic leader, etc., um, to better manage the stock. So my last uh, proposal would was this combination of adaptive management and fleet capacity control with also ecosystem consideration, participative management with a uh, world game playing, etc. And finally, uh, despite the lot of unknowns, um, so young people, students, don't be afraid, you will be unemployed due to the lack of topic of research. The more we learn, the more we know that we need to learn even more. Um, but uh, despite this, um, those pelagic fishes generate several original hypotheses in the recent years, and I'm still convinced that there is more to come. Thank you. Yes, you're fully right, and I, I forgot to mention that in the, there is a paper um, in press that I sent to the student where we, we, we mentioned that we, and we, we study, in fact, also the overcapacity of uh, the processing industry in Peru, and it's the same number. I didn't give you the figure. It's 300 percent. 
taking into account uh, the fact that you need a certain level of overcapacity to manage properly and spoil properly a fishery uh, because uh, of this internal renewal and interdecadal variation. So um, this is, this is a, a, a good point. Now, how, how to deal with that, how to control that? Um, as you say, it's more difficult than, than for fleet because you, you can, you can as you say, move the, 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 the factories, but um, there is still a um, possibility, and this in South Africa, remember, was used uh, with those foreign fleets, some of them, not the case in South Africa, but um, traditional foreign fleets from, from the, the former Soviet Union as this possibility of processing on board. In South Africa, what they did, in fact, uh, they invited the neighbor country, Namibia, to, to, to fish the excess, uh, and then they carried that back to their country. So there was still some possibility, even in that case, yeah. So maybe I can follow up. And your recommendation was to sell high and buy low. Mm. But Yeah. Lobbying effort and that high market out when yeah. you expect you're in the you're seeing that you hit the top. Yeah. Down. Yeah. The, it, it's a difficult issue, and the experience of, of managing fisheries with buying backs and things like that in Europe uh, has been most of the time a disaster, uh, because in fact uh, people sold their old boats, the old one, and, and uh, with the, the money that they receive uh, from the government by bigger vessel, and more modern. Uh, or if not bigger, at least more powerful. And uh, so the result was the opposite of the one expected. Yeah, um, it's, it's not an easy uh, issue. F first of all, you, you have, and this ITQs can partly achieve that even in pelagic fisheries, to reduce the overall overcapacity. Uh, 200, 300% uh, 300 is, is unacceptable. That, that's the first, f first level. And then uh, trying to, to modulate that, um, you don't have necessarily to sell. Uh, if you have uh, this regional flexibility, for instance, uh, your fleet uh, can, can go fishing in neighbor area or countries when it's a big country like uh, uh, the States, for instance, it can be in um, uh, another region. But you can also have more versatile flight, fleets, uh, as I say, that can uh, convert and you can encourage them to convert from one stock to, to the other. So these kind of things can be helpful. But there is Another option that I didn't discuss, and maybe some people can uh, argue on that. Um, another solution maybe is to accept that we are presently uh, over-exploiting our, our ecosystem, even when we m manage to maintain sustainability of, of uh, given stocks. And uh, as is the case for, for the Californian sardine, presently where the fishing mortality rate is extremely low compared to what it was in the past, you see, um, if you do that, uh, then you not necessarily have to change the overall capacity of your fleet. You you accept that in very you have a very low level uh, effort, and you, you in a small fleet, and you accept then uh, in favorable decades or years, uh, you will lose uh, some of the potential catches, but this will, uh, in the best of the case, benefit to other species in the ecosystem, and even if not, you are on the safe side. So this is also an option. And uh, you also preserve the birds and so on, and the mammals, so it's not nothing for everybody necessarily. Yeah, this one. The, 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 the additional uh, catches, you mean? Yeah. Um, 
There are still uh, a few stocks around the planet that are underexploited or even non-exploited. Um, like for, <laughs> for, for instance, uh, the mesopelagic fishes, the krill, things like that uh, probably will be exploited. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and possibly um, we still observe that. Uh, the recovery of some uh, overexploited stocks, once more, the Californian sardine is a good example, um, can provide some surplus. Well, it's difficult to answer, but um, yes, there is hope. For, there, there are some uh, efforts in modeling uh, with um, the conventional EcoPass with ECOSIM, um, but also uh, with uh, the new model that I presented uh, that shows that uh, should be the case, yeah. You can be relatively optimistic about that. But of course, the new uncertainty now to make it even more complex is the global change. And uh, here it's even more difficult to predict because we are outside of the range of observation, so we extrapolate. So that's, that's a difficult issue. Um, but as I said, um, it should change a lot of things, but not necessarily affect the global production. And uh, my feeling, I, I don't want to, there are no fishermen in, in the room, <laughs> is that it's more likely that it will increase than decrease the global production. Uh, but in some area, it will dec decrease it, of course, obviously. Do you have uh, any view of confidence that the fisheries planting will be 120 million tons? That's not FAO, and it's also um, Delgado et al., uh, which is not from. Uh, yes, this is, sorry, I, I didn't put that on the slide, it's 2010, yeah, it, indeed, this figure is 2010, the, the, the orange uh, numbers. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the aquaculture is certainly will increase, uh, but um, the sustainability of aquaculture, of the present aquaculture, which, which as you know, is largely based on, on small pelagic fish, uh, fish meal and fish oil, um, is not obvious uh, because, of course, uh, these uh, uh, fisheries have uh, reached some limits, uh, except the mesopelagic fishes, and um, to what extent a substitute uh, will be able to do it, like the soya meal, we already know that uh, the amino acids are not the same. Some of them are essential and not fine in, in, in soya. Um, in so um, there is a big uncertainty. That's why there are these question mark here. Yeah, can you comment on why there's so few species of blood? Oh, yeah. Uh, not, not sure the answer. <laughs> That's a good, a good question. Um, they're, they're, po po I don't know really. Possibly, um, possibly uh, because the, the, the ecological niche are not that many, and uh, they are very ancient species, and uh, many uh, they manage to, to exploit this part of the ecosystem that is by far less complex. Although we underestimate the complexity of the pelagic realm because we human just see everything blue and but different. But 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 nonetheless. Um, if you compare to, to Demersal species and, and to, to, to Bantic species, uh, it's obvious that it's much more complex and that you need probably uh, more diversity there. Yeah. Uh, why the species? Not affected by density dependence. Which species? Oh, oh yeah, 
why the pelagic fish are not density dependent, in, especially in the stock uh, uh, recruitment relationship? That was a question. No, I have no, no answer to that, no real answer. Um, maybe the answer is that um, there are so many sources of, of mortality, you see, of this fish. Um, advection for pelagic fish mostly, you see. Advection is probably one of the first ones, especially in the very, very early stages for eggs, you see. Then they suffer for detrimental temperature, when, especially when they are going deep with, with the, uh, the currents. Uh, then uh, they, they suffer, of course, by predation. Then it's most important thing. But predation by everybody, you see, because it's size-based, as I say. So everybody is eating eggs and larvae. Um, uh, so it's um, when and, and also because you have this uh, so high fecundity, and uh, and you have also this strategy, you see, which is um, um, consisting of spawning everywhere, very opportunistic, everywhere and every time. Um, so how mechanisms that will allow um, to control this density dependence uh, through reproduction are. are Probably very difficult to imagine. So this is my interpretation. Yeah. Cannibalism, of course. Uh, you have sorry, cannibalism, as I mentioned, is one thing that you expect uh, could work. You see, uh, um, because the more fish you have, maybe the more angry they are, and so especially on on the right hand part of, of the stock uh, recruitment relationship, where, where, where you expect. This is what, what things are difficult to observe because the left hand part, well, first it must go to zero, zero, and then it's only positive values, so it must increase. But then uh, these uh, depensatory mechanisms, um, you can think in cannibalism, a lot of species, so angry species, angry uh, fish, so they, they with a lot of, of cannibalism, and then it reduces the production. But um, in any case, even if it uh, decreases it by a half, um, there are still, uh, you see, hundreds of eggs per gram of females. So, 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 so it's billion eggs. So very difficult to have mechanism, the passenger mechanisms. I'd like to thank the audience first of all because I've picked up at least two potential exam questions for the Fisheries Oceanography course. <laughs> That's great. I'd especially like to thank Pierre for a very entertaining and in-depth look at pelagic fish that I don't think that are not attention. I'd also like to invite you all and Pierre to hopefully if the magic has worked for reception. It will be outside to join us. <laughs> and with that, conclude our talk this evening. Thank you very much.